Listen, I'm struggling for content here. It's not so easy coming up with videos every single night. What is up, Bills Mafia? We have 228 days to go until the Buffalo Bills win Super Bowl 57. And this channel is going to document every single day leading up to that amazing moment with a video. Tonight, I want to share with you my favorite Bills documentary. I saw this a number of years ago and I came across it on YouTube recently. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to share this with you guys. Maybe you've seen it. Maybe you haven't. Even if you've seen it, you'll probably enjoy watching it again. If you haven't seen it, you're in for a real treat. It's pretty long. So I'm going to do probably a three-part series on it. Maybe four, maybe five. I'm not sure how many. But for the next few nights, that's what I'm going to do. Because, listen, I'm struggling for content here. It's not so easy coming up with videos every single night. Especially now that we're in sports purgatory where there's only baseball. So, with that said, here's part one of this amazing documentary. Buffalo smells like a football town. It feels like a football town. The climate there, the winds of the lakes, the whole thing reminds you of a football game of the 60s. It's very nostalgic and very classic in that way. And you could talk about the football teams in all the cities in America, but I promise you, it's deeper there. It's deep. Where else would you rather be than right here, right now? Would you rather be than right here, right now? There are really only two seasons in Buffalo, and that's uh, Bill season and waiting for Bill season. That's the way it is in Western New York. It's a way of life. The Bills are a way of life. You can get it done. You can get it done. What's more, you gotta get it done. Let's go, guys. We're gonna knock their ass off. Here's a run by Antoine Smith. Antoine ran right over the safety. A running play for the Thomas breaks it at the 25. Still on his feet at the 20. Gets down to the 15. The Tampa five and scores. To the city of Buffalo, to the Buffalo Bills organization, I love you. The Bills have done it again. Do you believe it? And now it's for the 2,000 boys. It's like a college town in many ways. If you go to downtown Buffalo, there's banners out the windows, people wearing sweatshirts and t-shirts. Go Bills, go Bills. Ferguson rolling out, looking, throws toward the end zone, it is Bills for the touchdown! They tore the goalposts down and, and they passed one of the uprights all the way up from the field to, to my box. And that was part of what we wanted to give back to them. We wanted to go out and play extremely well. We wanted to make those people very proud of us. What a fantastic play by Jim Kelly. Spectacular touchdown run by Kenneth Davis. Oh, was that ever spectacular? We're awesome. To be able to accomplish what we did, it's unbelievable. I mean, how many teams get to the Super Bowl as many times as the Buffalo Bills? That whole run was a run of greatness, and history will show that there won't be another team to do what this team did. Reed at the 20-yard line, still on his feet, to the 15, down to the 10, to the 5, and for the touchdown! I still hear echoes from those sounds which glorify this game. I hear the cheers of the crowd. Bills can win it here, White puts it down, the kick is on the way, and it is good! The memories, uh, their treasured memories, and to have been part of it, is it gratifying? You bet it is. Touchdown, Roscoe Parrish! Unbelievable! 73,000 jaws dropped right now because just electrifying, and he brings this crowd to life once again. All people wanted in Buffalo was just one. Just once to say, yes, our time has come. There can be no finer tribute to the 50th season of Buffalo Bills football than the one in Tampa, Florida in January 2009. The Board of Selectors met today, and now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor and pleasure to present to you the Pro Football Hall of Fame Class of 2009. Bob Hayes, Randall McDaniel, 
Bruce Smith, Derek Thomas, Ralph Wilson Jr., and Rod Woodson. I'm, I'm just so blessed. I realize that some folks may look at this as a sign of, of weakness or, or what have you, but I cry because I'm not less than a man. I cry because I am a man. And this is very special to me. Well, I started the, the franchise in Buffalo. You have to have cons consistency in a, in a franchise because people become attached to a franchise. They take their children to the game. So many people across the country I have met who have said, my father used to take me to the games in Old War Memorial Stadium in downtown Buffalo. Pro football returned to Buffalo in 1960. The Bills were one of eight upstart franchises which challenged the established NFL. Owners of the new American Football League were labeled the Foolish Club. It started out with Ralph Wilson. He and his father were minority owners of the Detroit Lions. If you're a minority owner of a team owned by the Fords, it, it's very minor. It was the novelty of having a football team. It wasn't, he wasn't a billionaire chess player. He, he really enjoyed the idea of having a professional football team. Here's a man that started a franchise, builds this franchise in a city he knew nothing about. In fact, the early Bills looked very much like the Detroit Lions right down to their uniforms. Honolulu blue and silver uniforms were just part of the team's Detroit connection. They hired Buster Ramsey, who was a Lions defensive uh, assistant, to be the first head coach. And a lot of the players that he brought with him were players that um, had been let go or he had played in Detroit in one, at one time or another. Buffalo's first training camp was hardly up to NFL standards. When we were staying out at the old Roycroft out at, in uh, East Aurora, as I say, there was, uh, there was six, seven, eight, nine guys to a room out there. We practiced on old Knox Field, which was an old horse pasture. We went through football players like uh, water, and uh, you know, every time an airplane would go over, we'd look up and say, here comes another uh, a load of uh, football players. Fans turned out to see the Bills, though the rest of the league was struggling. The Oakland franchise, in particular, was on the verge of collapse. Ralph Wilson looked at his venture with the Bills as having a stake in the league. He actually secretly bought a large chunk of the Oakland Raiders for over $300,000. It was against the rules. You couldn't have ownership in two teams, but they couldn't have a team fail, because if, if a team failed, the league would likely have a domino effect. The league remained on solid ground. The Bills' aging stadium, however, seemed to be sinking into the Buffalo soil. They called it the rock pile. I never called it that, because it seemed like that was a little bit disrespectful. I really enjoyed playing there. It was a, a really a dumpy place, a hellhole. It's the only place I've ever been to when you walk off after a game, we put our helmets on because you get hit with full beer cans. This is the only place that they actually threw full beer at you which is kind of crazy. It was nice though, because you could, you know, you catch one and have one on the way to the locker room, if you, you know, if you're, you're lucky enough to grab one. In 1962, Buffalo hired Lou Saban. In less than a year, he would completely overhaul the franchise. Well, the first thing he did was get rid of the blue and silver uniforms. <laughs> he, he came in and he changed the, the color scheme to the red, white, and blue that we actually have today. He pretty much gutted the team. I mean, they called him Trader Lou, and rightly so. There was one Tuesday where he released five players, including the starting quarterback. He just got rid of them. He just sort of set the tone for the entire Saban era. Saban had set a tenure, had created an atmosphere here that he kept all the time he was here. I want him to enjoy what they were doing. They're going to have bad days and good days, but try to maintain an even keel because you're going to have your ups and downs. Nothing is perfect. I think he was really good with personnel. He knew how to push the buttons for different players. And the player he had the most problem with was obviously Cookie Gilchrist. Oh boy, Cookie Gilchrist. Cookie was a, a, a unique guy. I could tell you a couple, a couple cookie saving stories, but uh, they'd be X-rated. He was a mega character. 
Carlton Cookie Gilchrist went right from high school to the Canadian Football League. His personality and style of play were just as unique. I've been in football since I was in the fourth grade. Cookie Gilchrist is the best football player I've uh, ever seen or been associated with. I think one of the greatest fullbacks in the history of professional sports. And here was a guy that did everything. Cookie could play every position but quarterback. In fact, he wanted to get the three salaries. He wanted to play offense, and he wanted to play a defense, and he wanted to play on special teams, and he thought he had to get three separate contracts. Cookie stuck to offense, and his combination of size and speed were unmatched. Six foot two, 251 pounds, 4640. 52 inch chest, 31 inch waist. Cookie enjoyed running the ball straight ahead so that he could get to hit somebody. And he would tell you, you better get out of the way because I'm coming. It didn't matter if I was in his way or the guy I was supposed to block was in his way. You know, he was gonna hit somebody. It only took one running over to convince me that I needed to block the guy in front of me and get the heck out of the way because he was tough. Gilchrist was at his toughest when his team needed him most. It came down to the final game of the season where the Bills had to go to Fenway Park and beat the Patriots. The first play of the game, Cookie ran, ran around the end. And the cornerback on that side was Chuck Shanta. And Shanta was, was going to tackle him. And Cookie had this thing, he would bring up his right arm like a hammer. And instead of Cookie trying to avoid Shanta, he ran right into him. Knocks him out cold and the players, the other defensive guys are kind of gathered around. Cookie turns to the Boston huddle and says, which one of you mothers is next? Which one of you guys are next? Which one of you mother is next? <laughs> they were right in the tank, we won the game like 32 to seven or something like that. By the mid 60s, the Bills roster included Captain Billy Shaw, safety George Sames, defensive tackle Tom Seastack, receiver Albert Dubinion, soccer style kicker Pete Gogolak, and a young linebacker named Marty Schottenheimer. But Buffalo's real coup was stealing quarterback Jack Kemp from San Diego. On the AFL at the time, there wasn't an injured reserve that you could put a player on. You had to waive a player to make room for a replacement. The Chargers thought they could sneak Kemp through waivers unclaimed. They were wrong. It was skullduggery with a friend of mine involved greatly, former newspaper man. Well, this PR director in the league office uh, called the Buffalo Bills and tipped him off that, uh, that Jack was on the waiver wire and was available for anybody that grabbed him, and that was my father. You know, Buffalo Bills, they looked up big time. We couldn't believe we were gonna get a, a player of this caliber. Once Kemp's injured thumb had healed, he became an on-field leader, and the Bills became winners. In 1962, Buffalo lost just one of their last nine games. In 63, they posted their first winning record. I've always felt that quarterbacking is about 90% mental. That is, there are many football players, many quarterbacks who can throw and carry out the mechanics of quarterbacking, but in the final analysis, the difference between the average uh, quarterbacks and the good ones are the ones that uh, who can handle the, the mental aspect, that is the audibleizing and, and the calling of plays. While the rest of the AFL passed first, Kemp used the run to set up the pass in an NFL-style attack. Jack was just a great leader. He, he wasn't a phenomenal quarterback, he had a great arm, but he wasn't the Joe Montana kind of quarterback. He was a leader. Kemp's leadership faced a stiff test in 1964. After starting the season with nine wins, the Mercurial Gilchrist, upset about his workload, stormed off the field during a loss to the Patriots. Saban immediately cut Gilchrist from the roster. I went to the squad and I said, in all fairness, I don't like what he did. He hurt our ball and it cost us the game. Now we have a great football team here. This is coach we'd like to discuss. It took a meeting called by Kemp the next night, Monday night. Came back to me and says, we want to do something we can do for Cookie. Would you please bring him back? 
because this is all he's got. Now, I guarantee you this, it'll never happen again. How could I refuse him? With number 34 back in the fold, the Bills won three of their last four games. This was a, you know, a Green Bay style offense and a, and a strong, strong defense led by Joe Collier as their defensive coordinator. You had guys like Tom Sestak, uh, Mike Stratton, Butch Bird, Booker Edgerson. They went 16 straight games without giving up a rushing touchdown. The Bills defense played a major role in clinching their first division title. In the AFL championship game, Buffalo faced halfback Keith Lincoln and the Chargers high-powered offense. For Saban, it required the pep talk of his life, one that had a strange impact on the team's punter. We're like a 17-point underdog at home. And he said, we've gone through everything that we could possibly go through. The only thing I could tell you is heads down, toes up. So Cookie and I went out the door, and Cookie comes back in and he goes, what the hell does that mean? And Saban said, I don't know. I'm as nervous as you are. The nerves showed. San Diego took an early 7 to nothing lead. Linebacker Mike Stratton changed the game in one play. And you could hear that whoop all over the stadium. You could just see the, 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 the whole balloon be, be deflated. Their, their best running back down the tubes. From that point on, it was all downhill for San Diego. San Diego never recovered. The Bills controlled the ball and the game. Over 42,000 fans watched as the Bills methodically pounded the Chargers. Buffalo was the AFL champion. We didn't play for money. We played for the ring because the ring, the championship, said that uh, at one point in your life, you were the very, very best in the entire world at, at what you did. That is some really cool stuff, and you're going to really enjoy this documentary as I continue to show the parts. And if you want to see the whole documentary right here, right now, I like the sound of that every time I say it. If you want to see the whole documentary, I'll have the link in the description below. You can just click on it right now and watch the rest. Otherwise, just wait until tomorrow. I'll have part two the next day, part three. And like I said, maybe I'll do five parts. I don't know. I'll figure it out. Like I said, I just got to fill content over the next 228 days. It's not so easy, but it's fun. See you tomorrow.